everyone. Thanks for joining me in this episode of Behavioral Observations. This is the 14th installment of the Inside Java series, and Dr. John Barrero, Java's editor-in-chief, and I are joined by Drs. Brett Gelino and Derek Reed, and we discuss a novel study that they and their colleagues conducted on the University of Kansas campus. The study, which culminated in the paper, Tobacco-Free Policy Reduces Combustible Tobacco Byproduct, shows how a group of behavior analysts teamed up with university policymakers to craft and evaluate a campus-wide tobacco-free initiative. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. On the one hand, policy evaluation or policy development may sound like a dry topic. But if you step back and think about this for a minute, this is really a cool example of how we can use behavior analytic concepts and principles to solve socially relevant problems and basically to solve them at scale, which we don't get to do a lot in our work. So, you know, another way to perhaps think about it is like, how many times have you seen a well-intended policy get derailed because people haven't thought through the unintended consequences because they didn't have sufficient background in just what uh, dr- what drives behavior, what drives human uh, behavioral patterns. So to my mind, this piece of research is really exciting and promising. There's a lot of cool things we get into in this particular conversation. Uh, and there's a lot of things that, even though this was written up and published in Java, there's a lot of things that couldn't get into the paper itself. So this conversation represents an opportunity to really uh, tell the complete story behind this project. And if you care about dissemination, if you care about, again, using behavior analysis to solve problems at scale, this is the podcast for you. And whether or not you care about tobacco-free campuses or not, think of this as a template or an example. So uh, I really hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Uh, as all Inside Java series shows are, this one's available for CEUs. So if you're interested in learning more about that, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs. Uh, we'll also have a list of links in the show notes. And uh, you can check out the heat map. If you don't know what the heat map is, we talk about it in the show. Uh, I'll have a picture of the heat map there. I also have a picture. Of, I just posted the picture of the heat map on my Instagram page. So if you're not following me on Instagram, go to instagram.com forward slash behavioral observations. And um, sign up for the email list if, while you're over at Behavioral Observations because I send the show notes directly to your email inbox. So I think that's it for opening remarks. I want to keep these short because uh, we, we have a really fun conversation. I want to get you to it as soon as possible. So having said that, without any further delay, please enjoy the 14th installment of the Inside Java Series podcast. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, everyone, welcome to the Inside Java Series Podcast. I think we're up to number 14 now, which just kind of continuously blows my mind. I know I say that every Inside Java Series Podcast, but it, I, I really do love doing these episodes. It's just an honor and a treat. So uh, we've got a uh, kind of a full house here. I'm joined by the new editor-in-chief, Dr. John Barrero. I'm also joined by Drs. Derek Reed and Brett Gelino. Uh, and we've got a really great paper to discuss. And I think the way to start this off, I'm going to throw it to you, John, right away, because I know you had some, or I guess, some overall organizational thoughts to get us going. So uh, well, let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I, I, I'm really glad to be able to have the opportunity to talk about this paper because it's um, it represents one of the themes that I want to to see enacted during my term as editor. Like a, like a lot of behavior analysts, I've become increasingly interested in uh, ways to promote effective dissemination and to do so to diverse audiences. And in my term, what I want to do is have a number of invited papers that address several aspects of dissemination, because I think dissemination is is a multifaceted endeavor. Uh, So in this vein, I've come to appreciate a distinction that's been made between distribution of scholarship and dissemination of scholarship. And the distribution of scholarship generally involves what we do in our academic journals. We publish papers, we give presentations. 
Um, but dissemination is a little bit more than just distribution. When, when we think of dissemination, it involves making sure that our, our procedures are embedded at scale and that these procedures are able to be replicated in new contexts. And historically, behavior analysts have talked a lot about the ways in which the science of behavior can be used to save the world. Uh, I believe our procedures and our understanding of contingencies positions us very well to have an impact for large scale societal concerns. Um, but we have had some challenges in enacting some solutions to these problems. And this is not necessarily for a lack of trying. There have certainly been leaders in our field who have championed this cause. Um, I'm very confident in what behavior analysts have to bring to the table. Um, but my hope is that we can become a little bit better at framing what we do in a way that's going to be very compelling to broad audiences and in a way that brings behavior analysts to the table. So I think the paper that Brett and Derek and their colleagues have published in Java, is, it's different. And, and I want to acknowledge that right off the bat. It doesn't involve a traditional single case experimental design, and it did not involve direct measurement of behavior. But what it does do is it provides us with a model for some ways in which behavior analysts can become involved in policy-oriented research and practice. And it offers some fairly sophisticated statistical analyses as supplements to visual analysis when a traditional single case experimental design is not deemed feasible. And we have a lot of good examples of this in Java where um, single case experimental designs have not been the design of choice. Uh, to address some policy related matters. And I'm very glad to see that Brett and Derek highlighted a number of those citations in their paper. So there's historical precedent for Java papers that do not necessarily check all those seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis. And I also think that this work uh, represents what Tom Critchfield and Derek Reed have described as the fuzzy concept conceptualization of applied behavior analysis. Uh, we're fortunate to have Derek here, so he can correct me if my conceptualization is wrong, but I can tell you that for me, Derek, um, what this means is that we need not have all seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis to have a work be considered an exemplar of applied behavior analysis. So I'm particularly grateful for Dr. Bethany Rafe, who served as the action editor on this manuscript, and the panel of reviewers who recognized that this was a, a valuable contribution despite not checking all seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis. So I found this paper particularly interesting because the independent variable itself was relatively simple. Now, I hope that Brett and Derek are not offended by that statement because I realized that there's a lot of work that went into that. Um, but the idea itself was just a ban on smoking and tobacco use. But what they did was introduce a measurement system into a large scale um, system that was uh, useful in determining whether or not this policy was having the desired effect. So I think the work that Derek Brett and their colleagues have done is an exemplary encapsulation of this goal. And I'm very happy to see this work in Java. So with that as a bit of prologue, um, Brett and, and Derek, I was hoping that you might be able to describe the steps that went into this paper. The reader is going to learn very quickly in your in reading your paper that this was a process that was years in the making. And I think that the final count was 12 pages uh, of this manuscript. So you have a lot of work that I hope that listeners will be able to learn about that may not have been captured in that paper. So can you just elaborate or, or describe the steps that went yeah, just before we get to that, I just want to make, uh, I'm sorry to butt in here, but I just want to sure. orient the listener. I mean, God forbid someone skipped the introduction because I've already mentioned this because I know people never, ever do that. But just in case someone's in a real hurry and they skip the introductory comments, I want to just let folks know that this paper is in the uh, the forthcoming issue of Java. It's called Tobacco-Free Policy Reduces Combustible Tobacco Byproduct on a Large University Campus. And there are a number of authors. I think there's like at least six or seven authors in addition to Brett and Derek here. So um, I just wanted to add that for folks who who may be following along, who, you know, just may have uh, accidentally hit the fast forward button okay. through those introductory <laughs> comments. So go go right ahead, guys. Thank you. Sure. I'll, I'll take it away from here for uh, 
the background of the study. So this all began back in 2013. And so at this point, I was only three years into my career here at the University of Kansas. Um, and at that point, uh, Steve Fawcett, who if you're a reader of Java, you're probably familiar with his name. He's done a lot of the influential work on behavior analysis and, and health policy and public policy. And so he was the director of the Center for Community Health and Development at the time. So KU had a rich history of having the benefit of having some good behavior analysts at the helm who knew how to do this work. And they had been contributing to KU for a while in terms of putting forth some behavioral solutions to, to health issues. And so this idea came across from um, Ola Fauché, who was our HR director at the time, and Heidi Garcia, who was the director of our health education resource office at the University of Kansas. And they had been working with some student groups in, again, early 2013, who were really interested in reducing smoking on campus. And so some student groups had done some surveys and found that people wanted to see less of it. People were smoking in front of the buildings and it was just not a great you know, kind of situation. And so they thought we should develop a policy to, to ban that. And at the time, there were a lot of other universities already doing this, but KU was kind of behind the game a little bit with that. And so they had reached out to the Center for Community Health and Development, and I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Fawcett recommend they get in touch with me as a new faculty member willing to take some stuff on. So we started this steering committee in 2013, and this was uh, part of a provost initiative to see what we could do with this. Um, the process ended up taking five years from the beginning of the steering committee until this policy went into place, and a lot happened in there. Um, I'll just kind of gloss over some things, but one of the first things that they did, and I really appreciated it because it brought me into the table, uh, was try to identify a faculty member, so that would be where I came in, who could offer some academic, you know, some scholarship to this conversation. So it wasn't just administration doing this. They wanted some expertise. So they wanted a behavior analyst um, who kind of knew how to do some of this work. And so I was the only faculty member involved with this uh, steering committee from the beginning. Um, at the time, I brought in uh, one of our co-authors, Gideon Naude, who's now a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and he helped me um, in the initial uh, couple years of this, attending monthly meetings. So we had meeting after meeting after meeting, talking about, you know, what do we want to do with this? Um, we ended up getting a grant from the Kansas Health Foundation, um, and this was to be able to pay for um, having some expertise come in and kind of guide us. So this was not something done in isolation. Um, so this grant funded uh, the consultative work of Ty Patterson, who was at the time the executive director of the National Center for Tobacco Policy. So he had worked with a no number of universities to uh, get these sort of initiative launched. And so once we had that, uh, we started to think like, how do we identify where to put up signs? Because we have to invest heavily in signage at the University of Kansas to tell people like this, not only is this policy in place, but we had signage um, warning people that this policy was going to be in place. So we wanted to get ahead of it. We needed some data to take to administrators and say, hey, look, this is important because ultimately the provost has to sign off on this. Um, we had to get other university committees on board with this, faculty senate, student senate. So there was a lot of research that happened, survey work, over those five years to try to create a, you know, a good argument for this, this to occur. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about a little bit later is some of the survey work that we did to identify spots on campus to target intervention. Um, I think that's a really neat part of this paper. And so we offered some really novel, I think, novel solutions to that, that I think only a behavior analyst could probably come up with. And then um, the last piece of this is that the committee was adamant that this was an empirical endeavor. And so initially we wanted to write into the policy that there would be formative evaluation of the policy every year. We wanted there to be data collection every year to change the policy as needed. We wanted to be a leader in this policy of uh, tobacco regulation on campus. That ultimately didn't happen, sadly. Um, they wanted to keep it a little bit more simple in line with kind of traditional university policy. But that led way to some of the data that ended up in the manuscript, which is direct observation um, of permanent products out on, on campus. So 
by 2018, this was all in place and it happened. Um, and then it's taken us some years to get it into print. Um, there was a lot of uh, revision through the editorial process, which we really appreciate because it, it helped us kind of refine the message. So this is another one of those cases of kind of a success story of peer review. Because um, what we submitted initially is not what ended up in the pages of Java in a good way. Um, it kind of forced us to think a little bit more critically, um, conceptualize things kind of a more basic behavior analytic way. Um, it refined our analyses a little bit. And so really, uh, really happy with that. And again, props to our AE, Bethany Rafe, for helping us with that. So that's kind of a almost nine year story in the making um, in just a few minutes. But that's kind of the backstory. All right. Sounds like lots of cool stuff. I, I want to get into the nitty gritty details of, of this because there's lots of interesting facets to this paper and lots of things from what I understand that, that just couldn't make it into print just because of the space considerations. But before that, I, I, I'd i like to talk, I, I think you made a couple of, you, both, you, both you and John made a couple of references to previous work uh, in terms of public policy. Uh, and you mentioned some of that, uh, you cite some... Um, previous work and studies, et cetera, in the introduction of your paper. So can you briefly just talk about some previous work in behavior analytic uh, research about public policy and things like that? I think there are some references to like uh, speeding and other sorts of things like that, things that are beyond what we typically think of of applied behavior analysis. Um, and and I, I think you started to kind of speak to this too, Derek, but one of the really fascinating parts of this paper that I got a lot out of is is how our existing behavior analytic tools may not necessarily be, or there's a challenge to using our existing behavior analytic tools in terms of evaluation. So I guess it's a multi-part question here, and you can take it in any order or direction you'd like. But maybe, I guess, start off with orienting the listener to just public policy in general as it relates to behavior analytic research. I'll let Brett take this one. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, as as John mentioned, there's a lot of um, this sort of work that's been published historically, particularly in Java, um, a lot of work that's looking to scale up behavior analysis. Um, and we look at, you know, some of the um, earlier movements like behavioral community psychology to try to get um, more boots on the ground and, and behavior analysis out in the community. Um, and so we were fortunate here at KU to have folks like Steve Fawcett so close at hand to be able to draw upon some of the work that they did early on. So I think we kind of have almost two streams of inspiration um, that we pulled from in, in, in designing this work and, and putting forth the analyses that we did. On the one hand, uh, we drew from you know, some of this foundational work, these almost like roadmaps, um, so to speak, for laying out interface between behavior analysis and public policy. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, Fawcett, uh, Steve Fawcett here at KU was um, uh, a big inspiration there. He was a part of this ABAI task force on public policy. Um, and, and that publication came out in 1988 and does a wonderful job laying out um, expectations for what policymakers are looking for and how we can, as behavior analysts, best interface with that. And, um, you know, we also drew upon some of the, some of the classics. So, you know, Mont Wolf and taught his discussions on social validity and ensuring that we're um, targeting the behaviors of interest and, and measuring it in the ways that are most impactful and most meaningful to the people with whom we'd be working. And again, a lot of these sort of um, aspects that are now embodied in behavioral community psychology in, in a big way. Um we also, you know, we drew on some of the work from behavioral economics. So Steve Hirsch lays out some some nice um, approaches to effort mitigation and effort manipulation. So in this case, one of the big um, decisions was to uh, reduce the effort required to access cessation materials for smokers. And um, we had a lot of resources available so that that wasn't a monumental task, but also increasing the response effort of actually smoking on campus. And, and you know, we still permitted folks, or rather the policy still permitted folks to smoke in their vehicles or just off campus, but um, gave them, you know, um, choices they had to make and 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 tried to guide behavior towards the more uh, you know optimal outcome there. Um but then you know as as you kind of specifically noted there was a lot of work um published historically in Java that 
struck directly at empirical findings or, uh, you know, uh, tried to do so, skirted around empirical findings as much as possible um, to actually address and, and evaluate policy. And so a lot of this, um, in, in my experience, and a lot of my background comes from an interest in sustainability, um, I found a lot of this work um, in that sustainability literature, particularly as in Java as well. And a lot of this came, you know, in the 70s and 80s. So we have, you know, for instance, Chapman and Risley looked at um, litter in a backyard, um, but their 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 dependent variable was um, the mean litter collected or, you know, St Hayes's, Steve Hayes's uh, marked item technique, um, looking at uh, the amount of items collected. Um, but that that was scaled up a lot. So, you know, um, there's a lot more recent work um, that utilizes a lot of these similar procedures. So in the 80s, we have um, uh, a, a work from Agras and colleagues um, in California looking at policies examining um, the impact of like um, public posting and even fines on water consumption during a, a drought in um, the the Southern California area. So we were able to pull on a lot of these sorts of um, extent publications to actually um, guide our work on that front. Very good. So um, Derek, I don't know if you want to speak to this, but uh, you know, I, one of the things that, uh, so it sounds like we have a, you know, some, some background of behavior analysis and in, in trying to look at some of these, you know, larger societal challenges and things like that but uh, uh, there there is some language in the paper that speaks to some of uh, some it's hard it's you know for lack of a better term it's really hard to use our existing skill the uh, toolbox if you will to in terms of single case design etc cetera, etc cetera, to examine these things can you talk about that a little bit sure so you know when you're doing things at scale um you don't have the luxury of reversing for example uh, so if you think about this policy in particular, uh, KU is in Lawrence, Kansas. And so when we think about KU, we think about the Lawrence campus. Um, but KU also has all sorts of offshoot campuses around the state, including a huge medical center in Kansas City. So this policy goes over all of that. And so, you know, in some way you can think, well, do a multiple baseline across all of these different sites. Yeah, easy peasy, um, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, administration would not go for that, obviously, because you've got to like this is a KU endeavor. And so once this thing's rolled out and it's, again, like five years in the making to start to stagger things, I think would be confusing to people. Um, I think it would kind of lay out a really odd sort of precedent that like, oh, well, the Lawrence campus is prohibiting smoking, but the med center allows it like that, that would be really weird. Right. And so um, we start to lose some of this uh, sort of, you know, the, the benefit of single case design. And this is something that, you know, over the past several decades doing publicity, but public policy work in um, behavior analysis, this comes up frequently, but fortunately over the last, you know, 20 years or so, there's been a lot of refinement in the ways we can analyze single case design data. And there's been a lot of discussion of this in our journals over the last couple of years in particular about using some sophisticated statistical approaches uh, to look at single case design data in a little different lens. And so um, one of the you know, things that we really benefited from was the expertise of our co-author, Sean Gilroy, who's got a specific expertise and interest in this process. He's a BCBA but he's also a you know, very gifted, uh, quantitative-minded psychologist. And so um, he worked with us to find a way to use some regression modeling to look at these comparison designs, which is what we're left with, because we can't stagger, we can't reverse, we have an A, B design. We see a lot of this in the history of policy work in, in Java and in behavior analysis. But now, you know, currently, we have these contemporary approaches that we didn't have before. So we have a way to use regression to kind of figure out like, not only is this a significant change, but what's the likelihood that this was due to chance? Um, so it starts to kind of involve some of the logic that we use with experimental control, but in a very kind of basic statistical way to rule out like this was just a kind of chance finding. Um, so I think that was a really neat thing that we were able to add into this and add to the literature. I think that uh, 
two of the major contributions of this work, and I think there's a lot more, uh, but two of the major ones that I want to emphasize is that, um, number one, I think this is the first campus tobacco policy paper that actually has like research design sort of elements to it um, and the cigarette butt uh, permanent product data collection. So I think it's a contribution to that larger body of literature. But I think the second major contribution is thinking about policy work in a behavior analytic framework, but not ruling it out because you can't use a reversal or a multiple baseline. Um, we have these statistical approaches now that we could start to use to look at these data. Um, and that wasn't something we had before, but hopefully moving forward, this could be something that other people can replicate or pull from. I see. I see. Very good. All right. So let's, um, so I, I think we've got a, a pretty broad base to go into the more finer grain details. Uh, so I appreciate you guys giving the listeners the background on that. And again, the I, I'll link the paper itself in the show notes for the episode. And, um, and it's uh, um, so folks, folks, I encourage folks to go check it out there. Um, so tell us. So let's get into the actual study itself. What what was the goal? Uh, what were you trying to accomplish? What were you? Uh, you know, uh, I know there's some really uh, unique uh, data collection methods and things like that. So kind of walk us through that that aspect of uh, the discussion today. Sure. I'll get things started and I'll let uh, Brett kind of speak to the cigarette butt data collection since he was our, our expert in that. Um, so the goal initially was to validate this policy. And so there was a lot of resistance to putting in place a ban on tobacco use at the University of Kansas. Um, as you might expect, whenever you put a, a regulation in place, people are a little hesitant for that. We wanted to have data to show that this was effective. Um, we wanted to have data to be able to show to our administration to say, look, this is working. Um, we wanted to have a contribution to literature. We wanted KU to be at the forefront of how you can empirically evaluate some of these smoking policies. Um, and so I think our initial goal was to simply collect some data. We intended to have resources over time to continuously monitor this, um, but ultimately that didn't happen. Uh, but to be able to like go back and collect more data over years to show that this persisted. Um, there are things we could do in survey work that would allow us to do that. And certainly we can go keep collecting cigarette butts and whatnot. Um, so I think the, you know, the initial goal was to simply show that this policy wasn't just something made up. Like there was real, there was a real need for um, the policy to begin with. And with that in place, like it's been effective. So people who might be skeptical of whether or not these things work, uh, we have some data to counter that. Um, and so, you know, what ended up happening is we had to come up with some unique sort of forms of data collection to make this happen. So one of the things that um, Gideon Nade and I kind of came up with was this heat map approach, which I'm happy to talk more about later. But this was a survey that went out to literally everyone in the University of Kansas email system. Um, so we got back, you know, thousands of responses, which is pretty incredible. Uh, it's hard because people want to know, like, well, what was the response rate? I don't know. I don't know how many people actually got the email, how many people opened the email. We didn't have that at our fingertips because this is a provost email system. Uh, but what happened was we sent out a survey asking people for their kind of thoughts and perceptions about smoking on campus, where they you know, could see interventions being needed. But to really quantify that, uh, we use this feature in the Qualtrics uh, survey platform that's called a heat map. So you could upload a picture. And in this case, we uploaded a basically the parking map of main campus, the University of Kansas. And we asked people, you know, you've got a budget of five clicks. Click where on campus you see the most smoking happen. Um, and so this survey platform aggregates these data and creates the heat map that is in the paper, which I think is a really cool figure. And what you see is like very clear, you know, reliability in where people are reporting because you get these really bright spots showing where there's the most amount of um, smoking occurring. So this allowed us to target those places for data collection because without that, you know, we'd just be collecting cigarette butts wherever was convenient or wherever we thought there was the most issue and we're biased because 
our buildings on the south end of campus, like the very edge. We're not really involved in main campus all that much. So we probably would have picked the wrong spots. It also allowed us to identify places to put up signage, not just for saying, hey, the policy is in place, but also posters warning like, hey, this is coming in 2018. You should start to think about how you're going to change your behavior. Um, Here's some resources to help you quit smoking. Um, Here's some resources about what the policy is going to say. That way you could change your behavior now so that when this policy is in place, you're not scrambling to change your behavior then. Um, And so that allowed us to uh, refine our data collection approaches. So the collecting of cigarette butts was a whole separate endeavor. And I'm going to let Brett talk about that and some of the work that he had to do to kind of coordinate with facilities uh, to accurately do this work. And I think that's something that got lost and isn't really reflected in the paper, but is super important for people who want to do this work. Yeah, that's a real interesting part of the paper. Uh, And I just want to let people know, I will put a pic, I'll cut and paste with permission from the publisher, a uh, a, a picture of the heat map in the show notes of this episode as well, um, which is not, which should not dissuade people from reading the paper, but I'm just, people want a handy place to go check it out. They can go to behavioralobservations.com and look for the show notes for this episode. So anyway, uh, so Brett, let's talk about cigarette butts. Yeah, I think we really had a a great opportunity um, to employ a data collection method here. As Derek said, Um, it wasn't the easiest method to come to, um, but we were able to, you know, rely on that early survey to identify our hotspots. And so we had an early um, idea of where we would be collecting these data. Um, admittedly, at first, we we collected data in two kind of concurrent streams. We looked uh, both at cigarette butts, and that was an early um, decision that we made. We wanted to make sure that we had um, something reliable and something that was lasting um, in terms of permanent product. But we also did try to do some direct observation of smoking itself to see if we could see change um, just through simple recording. And as it turns out, it's, it's trickier than it seems. It's, it's, really resource intensive and um, identifying the patterns of smoking is is tricky in that folks obviously tend to follow different, um, you know, schedules and whatnot. So we had originally thought, all right, let's get um, people outside of our, you know, one of the areas has a dining hall. Let's get folks out there right after lunch. Folks will come out for their after lunch cigarette. But, you know, as it turns out, it's not as reliably predictable as we expected. So the cigarette butt collections really did offer us a nice alternative that, um, you know, persisted even if people were smoking at night or smoking at odd hours, we were able to get that weekly accumulation rate. Um, but it really was an interesting experience. Myself and my colleague, our, our colleague, Dr. Allison Salzer, um, we, we did a lot of, um, a lot of walking around campus, a lot of, um, you know, uh, hand collecting of those cigarette butts. Um, And early on, we were collecting before the policy was put in place. So we were um, picking up those cigarette butts, you know, while folks were actively smoking. Uh, But before we could even do that, we had to sweep all of our target zones of every cigarette butt so we could get a clean weekly accumulation. So, I mean, our first count, we we probably picked up between two and 3,000 cigarette butts. Um, We were pulling them out in handfuls out of like those smoker chimneys um, outside of dining halls. It was a, a gnarly process. And we were laughing. I think both of us, by the end of our first day of collecting, were seeing cigarette butts, like identifying them so much more clearly, even outside of campus, walking around downtown Lawrence, just, you know, every time we saw a couple, it would, it would, you know, it would sting a little bit. Did, 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 um, you, did you, did you question your life choices at any point in this <laughs> process? Uh, I took a picture at one point of all the cigarette butts in baggies because we didn't want, I mean, we had to bag them and, and we we weighed them and we did a, a, a number of different um, approaches to actually trying to quantify. We, we After our baseline sweep and seeing as many as we collected, we figured counting might actually even be reasonable. But yeah, uh, when I took that picture and I saw, you know, the back of my car, my trunk full of cigarette butts and Ziploc baggies, I, I did question some of my choices at, at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, it, again, I think being on campus offered a really nice um, opportunity to to take this approach. Um, in large part, as Derek mentioned, we were able to coordinate with facilities on campus. And so um, I, I emailed a number of individuals and, and just, you know, even made requests such as in these particular locations. So um, one of our, our, our zones is on kind of a popular um, 
area with a lot of benches right on our downtown or sort of central campus strip, uh, Jayhawk Boulevard. And I just requested, can we hold off on on raking leaves and 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 doing any of the landscape activities for you know this four week period? And there was an, a, a tremendous amount of understanding and um, cooperation. Um, they completely understood. They were actually very interested and were like, uh, we'd love to see the data. We'd love to see, you know hear how this works out for you and and whatnot. So. Um, it, it was fun. It was a little daunting at times, but you know, at the end of the day, I think it was, it made for, um, yeah, at least a, a, a set of interesting stories for sure. What, what, what did you learn about the, the smoking habits that, that didn't make it into the paper or, you know, was, was there anything, or did you find anything weird in, 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 yeah, other than cigarettes, I, I can imagine just with a large public place like a, a university campus, uh, under, undergraduate students who may be, let's say, less inclined to you know put things in trash receptacles and whatnot. You know, was with the you know like what was like the the randomest thing you found, or was there any, or maybe maybe this was just a maybe 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 there was nothing uh, noteworthy. But uh, <laughs> those are the questions that I was thinking as I was reading the paper. Like, what else did they find in there? You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, and, and and maybe disappointingly so, uh, not as interesting as you might think. Um, okay. it, it also could be that we were sort of tunnel visioned on looking at specifically cigarette butts. Um, okay. There were, you know, an interesting and perhaps a, a higher quantity of um, non-cigarette combustible tobacco products that we found than I would have expected on a college campus. A lot more cigarillos, um, a lot more like wood or plastic tip cigars than I might have figured. But a lot of those were also congregated around um, folks or, or locations where it was more faculty. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Not so much faculty, but folks who were not necessarily part of KU's payroll, but rather like sort of contracted out by KU. Um, so for instance, um, there was a particular dining hall that was in one of our observation zones um, where there were, we kind of found a a spot behind a set of trees and bushes where it was clear that the employees were taking their breaks um, because there was always a, a really high concentration of cigarette butts there. And on a number of occasions, we were kind of working our way back, collecting the, the butts there. And particularly after the policy had been put in place, we ran into a few of these individuals who were taking their breaks and smoking a cigarette. And they looked very uncertain with our um, intentions and our goals with measuring the cigarette butts, You know, maybe a little bit nervous that we might get them into trouble, um, which was, of course, not our goal at all. Um, so, you know, it, I think it, as far as patterns of smoking, I'm not sure that it was the dining halls or, or let me rephrase that. I don't, I'm not sure that it was the residence halls um, that were really the primary sources. I think it was um, the, the, the buses, um, the um, folks working in some of the cafeterias, things like that, that were potentially producing a lot more of that litter um, beforehand. And then maybe a little bit afterhand too. Right, you mentioned the, some people looking askance at this collection behavior. Did anyone ask you, like, what the hell are you guys doing? You know, like a number of folks. Yeah, we 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 frequently had students asking us why we're picking up cigarette butts. Um, we had a number of individuals who were um, like. Uh, Custodial staff inside some of the the buildings come out and question whether we were. Um, one particular was asking whether we were trying to like basically clean up after them. Like they were coming out and like, no, I'll pick up the cigarette butts. Don't worry about it. Mm. Um, and so we had to explain, no, this is a research project. It's totally fine. Like we're we're actually hoping that you don't do that. Like that's very this is the ideal them. outcome. <laughs> yeah. So I think we made a couple folks nervous, and then um, once we assuaded, you know, confirmed that that was not our goals. Um, there was just a lot of you know general curiosity and a lot of eyeballs at all times. You know, in the middle of a an open space with a ton of students around us, and we're you know, asking to, to, can we get under your feet real quick and just move around these leaves? And there's, I see one cigarette butt there that I need. Um, it, it's definitely an odd, odd behavior to be engaging in for sure. You know, one of the things that that you've touched on a couple of times, and I think Matt's question got at has to do with the number of parties that need to be involved when things go at this level, when things go to scale. So you Brett, you talked about how facilities management, I thought that was a very interesting aspect of the paper where your role is asking another organization to not do their job for a specified period of time. I can imagine that if you were, for example, to ask them to do something 
that that might not have been as well received as having asked them to do to pause their efforts. So can you say a bit more about the the importance of working with multiple parties when you're trying to do something at scale? I mean, again, you, you suggested that this was very smooth sailing, and I'm glad to hear that. But for those who might be interested in doing policy research, um, perhaps they might not be able to anticipate such a smooth path in trying to coordinate their efforts with other groups. I think that's, uh, again, one aspect of working with a community or a community that is housed within a university, sort of addressing specifically university policy. It creates such a, a wonderful opportunity to actually um, probe the extension of our our, our approaches here um, to a policy analysis in that, um, yeah, we were really fortunate that facilities was so um, accommodating and, and uh, willing to be flexible and work with us and um, that we only had that one sort of collaborative hoop to jump through. Um, of course, we had all of the footwork that went into it and, and actually putting the policy in place. But for the evaluation period, that was really our only collaborative effort. But yeah, outside of a university or in a different potential university setting, um, it, it's critical, I think, to really sit down and think about all of the partnerships that are required, whether it be short term, long term, and think about um, the, the give and take that's required there. You know, as you said, um, asking uh, to, to to pause the um, the the work that's going on is I think a, a easier ask in some cases than than asking for something in particular. But I think that there's um, certainly compromises to be made, and and that's one complication that comes with this sort of work, right? Is that you can't control all factors, and in some cases, you know, it's entirely possible that facilities, you know, we were collecting cigarette butts at the time leading up to graduation, and when they're really trying to beautify the campus, it's always looking great. But in particular, that time of year, um, that was I think doing asking for 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 less work on one of our main you know areas of campus at that time of year was actually a fairly large ask um but you know it it comes with the territory that um i think again as you said really f determining what outreach is required what partnerships are required and you know reaching out and forming those relationships early and often is going to be really critical for for success in this sort of work and I'll add um, an area that I'd like to see more behavior analysts start to really engage with is community-based participatory research. And this is something, again, that the community health researchers at KU have been pushing for decades. And it's critical. Um, and this is, again, something that kind of got lost from the story in the manuscript. But we had an entire uh, separate group of meetings during that five-year process where we were meeting with like uh, the director of facilities, the director of uh, transportation at KU, people from um, dining services. And so we wanted to understand their needs. We wanted to understand, you know, their barriers to the policy. And so all of that kind of got channeled into what ultimately came into the policy. Um, but that's extremely critical. So that also gives you a little bit of authority in this in these situations. So if someone were to question what you're doing, like we have a, a charge from the provost's office to, to get this policy in place. And if they were to take this up the chain to their direct supervisor, who might be, you know, again, the director of facilities operations, they knew about it and they could go back and tell their, I mean, and they were supposed to, they probably did tell their staff and their, um, kind of supervisees that this was happening and um, to kind of work with them to, to start to prepare for it. And in some cases that meant helping us with the data collection and understanding that this was forthcoming. Um, so again, that's a, it's a large piece of what happened in this project that, you know, just for the sake of an empirical paper, just kind of got lost um, despite the, you know, scores of hours in meetings with these groups to, to really make that happen. So just and want to make a plug for that. That's one of the benefits of having this opportunity to be able to, yes. to tell that story. I'm really glad you mentioned participatory action research, because one of the other features of the paper that I found very interesting is that of the nearly 30,000 recipients who uh, received your email survey, uh, the majority of them were non-smokers, if I understand that correctly. So I, I found that to be an important component of the study, because the individuals who were most inclined to respond 
were likely those who were most disturbed by the, the, the act of smoking or engaging in tobacco use on campus and perhaps more disturbed by the, the litter that accompanies some of those activities. So I thought that was really interesting. And to me, it's one it's reflective of that social validity component that Wolf described very early on to make sure that you're addressing needs that are important to the, the people of concern. Yeah, good point, John. Um, so I want to, I guess, draw the the listeners' attention to the results, um, uh, particularly in Figure Two. So in, in the paper, uh, it, it did look like uh, across the various location sites. And please correct me if I'm looking at this uh, uh, wrong, but uh, that there was an overall reduction in the number of butts found at these sites. Um, uh, some, some, some. I guess pre and post changes more market than others, depending on the site, but there seemed to be an overall reduction. Uh, and I don't know, I, you know, one of the things I, I did want to talk about is perhaps the, uh, the, the, some of the linear aggression stuff, but I, Derek, I'll let you kind of get into that a, as you see fit. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I became curious about when looking at that, that figure, and, and again, just to kind of spell it out for the person who may be driving a car at the moment and not able to look at the, at the figure, uh, you know, there's there's uh, um, you know these these collection periods and what looks like in a baseline period before the policy went in place, and then after after the policy was enacted. So as you mentioned earlier, an A B design, and there looks like there's reductions across the board. Um, uh, what, one of the things I was curious about is, uh, do you guys have any guesses or hypotheses or whatever about you know, what actually happened? You know, in terms of the behavior change because we all know how intractable smoking is as a, as a, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, as someone once told me, you know, s- smoking is easy to quit. I've done it a bunch of times, meaning that, you know, it's a very difficult thing to kick. Right. So I'm, I'm, I, this part of me, it's like, okay, well, we, there wasn't this mass smoking cessation that might've occurred. Um, I, I, but maybe, maybe there has, do you have any sense about like where these butts went? Do people smoke less as a consequence or just smoke? elsewhere or yeah it's just what's your sense about the, the the results that are depicted in figure two i guess more generally sure um i'll dive into this and let brett comment a little bit more about some of the stuff we talked about in the paper but that was you know that's something that we've heard as a critique of this is like well you know you might not have reduced smoking you might have just pushed it to the outskirts of campus people might have taken up vaping they might have done other things that you know you're not tracking All true. Um, I think that something to keep in mind is like this policy wasn't meant to necessarily cause smoking cessation. Like that'd be great from a public health perspective if that's what happened. This policy was uh, marketed as kind of a have respect for others who might not use tobacco products. And, you know, we're not telling you to quit. But if you want to quit, we gave them resources. There there was some free uh, cessation resources that the university provided as part of the policy. Um, And people had, again, like two years notice of this so that it wasn't like, hey, you know, starting on this date, suddenly you're not allowed to smoke. So figure it out. Um, This wasn't the case. We wanted to have people prepared. But the goal was to really just make this a tobacco free kind of zone. Um, so if you don't smoke, you're not going to be walking through clouds of cigarette smoke, for example. You're not going to see cigarette butts around campus. So we weren't totally like just wanting to get people to quit smoking. Yes, that would be awesome from a public health perspective. Um, could it be that they turn to vaping? Yes, absolutely. And something to keep in mind is that over time, vaping has become more popular. And so this is where single case design, you've got to really look at the trends in the data to see if that was naturally reducing. Um, Vaping is one of those areas in the smoking literature where it's kind of contentious. Like, is this a good thing to encourage people to do? Because from what we can tell, it's less harmful than combustible cigarettes. Um, Does it cause people to start smoking? There's some evidence of that with younger people, perhaps. Uh, But the way we viewed it is vaping is less harmful from a public health perspective, as well as from the kind of respect aspect of walking through clouds of cigarette smoke. You're not going to get that with vaping. Uh, Vaping was quote unquote banned as part of this policy, but there's really 
not good ways to, to regulate that. As an anecdote, um, this policy went in place. I actually uh, originally <laughs> found some students in the back of my large lecture class. Like I could see them vaping. And it's like, well, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, that's not great because people smell that and they don't want that. Uh, so they had to roll out some additional marketing for that because that, yeah. Um, there's, you know, some concern that maybe everyone just went to the edge of campus and the community has started smoking. We haven't seen that. Um, yeah, that probably happened. Uh, one of the things that we made sure in our kind of uh, town hall meetings was that your vehicle, your private property, we get, we can't regulate what happens in your private property. You want to go in your car and roll the windows up and smoke? You're allowed to do that. We can't stop you from doing that. So people might have done that. We don't have the cigarette butts from inside their car. So don't know. Um, in terms of like why this works. Um, oh, and I'll also add, I have friends who use tobacco products and I know that they quit smoking because of this policy, because it just became too cumbersome. Like initially they would walk to their car, you know, when they wanted to take a break from riding, they take the 15 minute walk out to their car so they could smoke, but that just got old. Um, and so they, you know, turned to vaping and then eventually just quit because it was just too annoying. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good byproduct of what this policy aimed to do. Um, Brett, do you want to talk more about like maybe the specific locations and some of the stuff we kind of brainstormed in the paper about kind of the differential effects that we had, like in terms of, you know, the sites? Sure. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'll just add as well to, to kind of bolster that point that you're making here. Um, as a reminder, we did, you know, base our data collection zones, our, our hotspots off of that, that preliminary surveying. And if the goal of this policy was to reduce the um in some capacity to make the, the the whole campus tobacco free but also to reduce the exposure to some of the secondhand effects of smoking if we saw a dramatic reduction in cigarette use in those hot spots then i think that that's uh you know a, a success in and of itself a lot of these um hot spots were also the more heavily trafficked parts of campus and so um you know outright there even if folks are, as you know, Derek said, moving to the, uh, moving to their vehicles or whatnot, um, then indeed, I think that that would be considered a success. Now, um, we, uh, of course, in in the data collection process, as I said, we were, you know, before the policy went into place, bumping into folks, um, you know, some of the, 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 for instance, the dining hall staff smoking in their, um, their their break zone. We saw a lot less of that happening after the policy went into place. Really, a m much much less of it. That's why I said only one or two times, and folks seemed pretty concerned. Um, but I think from what we observed, a lot of it was. Um, one or two people moving to very discreet locations and based off of our cigarette butt collection efforts, not leaving behind an excessive amount of litter as well. Um, so the footprint of smoking really dramatically dropped um, as a result of this. And while there's, uh, you know, again, as, as Derek mentioned, there's, there's the chance that folks are moving to the outskirts of campus. Um, I'll also note that a lot of our hotspots were pretty far from the edges of campus, and there's not really a great demarcation of where that policy ends, um, where 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 the campus translates or transitions back into Lawrence and where a safe zone is. Um, on a number of occasions, we did, uh, myself and Ali uh, Salazar, uh, the other person we collected cigarette butts, um, we, we did kind of peruse the edges of campus. And you know, it's not like we suddenly saw an uptick in, in litter mm -hmm. there. So um, I, I do think that there's probably... A, a sizable reduction that occurred. Now, there were also a lot of folks that were coming through campus that I think it's difficult to determine how the policy impacted them because, as I said, a lot of them were sort of contracted companies through the University of Campus, uh, University of Kansas system here. Um, so, for instance, um, there was a, a pretty steady rate of litter um, where some of the buses would stop. And, and I think that's just because, you know, in theory, folks who are driving the buses for Lawrence aren't really members of the University of Kansas system. And whether that policy contacted them directly or whether they were visitors, it's hard to say where that's going to you know, take place and whether that's going to actually shift that behavior. And that's something to kind of maybe look at for future um, efforts, how those policies impact visitors who wouldn't consider themselves part of the university system in and of itself. Um, so I think that it was difficult to change behavior of those individuals, but um, seemingly as a whole, I, I think it's it's an interesting thing to note that um, 
generally speaking, the, the, the folks who were continuing to smoke were doing so um, in a, a uh, very considerate way. Got it. Got it. Do, you, do you guys have any plans to, you know, I know you're moving on to, uh, was it Johns Hopkins, if I'm not mistaken? Um, yeah. So this might be left to someone else, but do you have plans to do spot check follow-ups at, at these sites? It would be interesting to see. Uh, obviously, you know, right now it, it's been a couple of years since you collected uh, these data. I assume the policy is, hasn't changed since that implementation. Uh, it'd be fascinating to know whether or not if you if you uh, collected, um, you know, butts at those sites, uh, you know, if you'd still see something similar in terms of the reductions or is this something that, uh, you know, those signs just become kind of noise in the background that everyone kind of like, you know, maybe 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 the community attended to them once they went up and once the notifications went out, et cetera. What thoughts do you have in terms of follow up and and looking to see whether or not this, uh, uh, you know, this this reduction in smoking behavior or change in smoking behavior, whatever, however we want to construe it, uh, you know, I'm curious about the sustainability of this, especially in a setting like a a college campus where you have every every semester you've got a. Uh, a, a group of folks that's cycling through there. People are matriculating, people are coming in, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Sure. So yeah, I, I would love to do some more spot checks. And I think that's something that, you know, in some ways we could easily do because we have undergraduate research assistants who, who need to spend their time doing something. The difficulty is like without having this be part of like the policy development plan and all of that. We don't have that leverage of like going to someone saying this is part of the provost initiative. So facilities, please stop cleaning up the cigarettes again and all of that. Like, sure, we could ask them to do that, but we don't have as much authority anymore with that. Um, And another thing that I'll add that complicates this, and it's a complication of all policy research really, um, is a lot of other stuff changes over time as well that's outside our control. Um, And so I don't know what it was, but it was after our policy went in place, but uh, Douglas County where we live, they've increased the age for which you could buy cigarettes to 21. Mm. So that's been post this policy, post data collection. So any changes that we might see, like, is it a function of that? Or is it the persistence of the policy's effectiveness? It's hard to say. Um, There's been a huge proliferation in um, vaping. And so I think a lot of undergraduates who previously used combustible cigarettes have, have switched over to vaping. And that just kind of is a cultural thing in the United States. Uh, so I think that would change the data. Um, so all these sort of caveats in place, like, sure, we could probably reproduce our findings that we're still seeing low rates of cigarette butts, but there's a lot of other confounding factors that go into that. And that's the nature of the beast with with policy is that you can't control everything. Um, And to speak to one of the points that Brett was making about the bus stops, we also have this complicating factor of KU being a pretty big sports school. And so we get, you know, 20,000 people on the weekends visiting campus to go to basketball games, football games that have nothing to do with KU. And, uh, you know, so the fact that we didn't see a huge, increase or you know persistence in cigarette butts at those butt stops i think is pretty telling that you know this was effect pretty effective and that maybe those bus stops were all people who were going to basketball games and throwing their cigarette butts because they don't know about the policy mm-hmm. um so i don't know uh but that's also something to keep in mind is that you know policy affects everyone involved on the ku campus whether they're employed uh, enrolled in a course or whatnot, um, third party vendors delivering food, um, all of that, like they're, they're under this policy and having this reduction that we saw, I think is, is pretty, pretty impressive considering that we had no control over that. Um, but policy work is really messy. And I think that's why there's not a lot of it because as behavior analysts, we don't have that level of control that we're used to seeing in our clinics and our labs and I think it turns people off in some ways because it doesn't feel like behavior analytic stuff where you're controlling an indi- you know, individual organism, controlling every aspect of the environment. That just doesn't happen in policy work. And it makes it tricky. Kind of reminds me of why they call economics the, the dismal science 
uh, yeah, because you can't you can't tightly control everything. And yeah, absolutely. So as, you, as you as you quite rightly pointed out, uh, I, I want to zoom out a little bit uh, uh, and and talk about some of the attention that this might get outside of behavior analysis. But before I guess departing the the details of the of the paper itself to do that, I wanted to just see if you guys had anything else you wanted to say about the the, the study itself. Uh, particularly some of the you know the linear regression stuff and other sorts of things that might be a, a unique contribution that this paper offers. Sure, um, just a couple quick comments on that uh, as kind of parting things with the details. Um, the linear regression is interesting, and I don't want behavior analysts to uh, view regression as something that's outside the purview of what behavior analysts do. There are a number of um, great books out there that kind of lay out how we can use quantitative methods to understand single case design that's referenced in the paper. So there's a Hutima book that's kind of a classic um, that's cited in the paper, and that's where the models came from that uh, our colleague, Dr. Gilroy, used to analyze the data. Uh, and these are single case design researchers who have thought hard about how we can leverage quantitative methods to understand our data. Um, we could have, like, I teach an entire course on quantitative methods. So, like, trying to get this into one minute is super impossible. But I yeah, do yeah, yeah. I get. I, um, I just look it for a flavor, just to you know, kind of yeah. yeah, to orient the listener to to the importance of this. And so, you know, I don't want people to get turned off by it because regression mm -hmm. modeling is a lot like behavior analysis. Like we're trying to see a signal in the noise. We're trying to account for confounding variables. So you see, you know, data paths and data are kind of all over the place. It doesn't all follow a straight line, but how do we describe that data in the most accurate way? And so regression is kind of that process of fitting that line to reduce the distance between the line and the data points. And that tells us basically a description of what we're observing. But then what's great with, sort of the modeling that we did in this paper is you can compare the slopes of the lines between conditions and see whether there's significant differences. And so it's a logic of baseline logic. If you go back to the Cooper et al. white book, like baseline logic is a big feature of that. This regression modeling leverages that and allows us to compare the differences in the y-intercepts and the slopes. And it's all extremely compatible. It just uses a different sort of analytic technique. Um, so that's one. The second thing really to underscore is this uh, heat map approach. I think there's a lot of potential here. Um, we have a study that we've since done to try to validate the heat map approach that we will hopefully be submitting to Java in the very near future. Um, so Qualtrics has this feature. I think there's a lot of uh, places where that could go. The issue is, is whether that's valid. And so we're using some behavioral... Uh, science techniques to try to validate that process with some simple observation techniques um, so that people can feel more reliable because it is self-report at the end of the day. Like you're clicking on a picture to, to report what you think you've seen. Um, so does that then map on to what we observe as trained observers of behavior? And so we've got some validation studies that we've since done um, to show that you get the same sort of thing. If you do a heat map based off of direct observation versus the self-report heat maps in a survey, overlap them, they kind of look the same. So there is some comfort level there. Uh, so hopefully that'll be in Java sometime. Um, we'll get that submitted. Uh, but those are the two big takeaways I think that I wanted to touch on. Brett, was there anything else you wanted to say about the details? I think you hit square on. Um, and the, the, anything that I wanted to hit, for sure. I, I'll, I'll jump in if I may. What One of the things that I, that I want to underscore, as Derek suggested, is that I think quantification is the language of science. And I, I think it's a subtle feature of this paper, but I don't want it to be lost. And that is that this permits Brett and Derek and his colleagues and their colleagues to speak to audiences that may be less familiar with interpreting single case experimental design. And there's a, a wonderful paper by Stuart Weiss in which he underscores just how important it is that we speak in a common language to other scientists. And, and that is a feature where I think we're going to turn to this momentarily, but uh, folks outside of behavior analysis may have interest in this work. I, I suspect that they would be quite interested in this work. And one of the things that's going to make this a more um, 
consumable scientific product is their ability to interpret it and to make sense of it. So I want to applaud you for for taking that step and to be able to speak to to audiences that might otherwise not the audiences for which this work might not hit their radar. But now that it's in a way that it's interpretable and understandable, it's going to have a much broader reach, which I think, again, is important in the context of disseminating the science of behavior. And this might speak to what you're going to get to in a second, Matt, but uh, piggybacking on that, um, there's been a couple of follow-up things that have happened with this paper. And I want to kind of go back in time. When we first submitted this to Java, we were adamant that we include effect sizes in this. Um, and particularly because we had reviewed the literature to date on tobacco policies on large campuses and organizations. And the papers that get the most attention are these meta-analyses. And meta-analyses are where people aggregate effect sizes of all these different studies and report them in one kind of major review of effect sizes. If you're just reporting a visual display, you have no effect size. Like you have to apply quantitative methods to get that number. And so when we read all these meta-analyses formalizing this, the policy in the paper, we wanna be part of that. And so that means you have to have an effect size. Within days of this hitting online first with Java, um, we got an email uh, from a researcher doing a meta-analysis of tobacco-free campus policy things. And they're able to use our data for this meta-analysis. Um, this is something I'm super passionate about, so I don't want to get on a soapbox about it, but no, no, COVID... <laughs> step up, step up to the soapbox. Let's, let's, right. let's hear it. Uh, you know, COVID, um, some of the meta-analyses that came out with behavioral health were so unfortunate because they didn't cite any Java work. And there was, there was a meta-analysis I saw about like hand-washing. And this was something that was done in a major journal. And there's a great body of literature in behavior analytic sources on hand-washing none of those were cited. And is it because people didn't value it? I don't know. Did they find it? I don't know. But at the end of the day, these were meta-analyses. Without having an effect size, they can't be included. They're just, it's just a non-starter. And so I think that's a huge limiting factor with our field is that without embracing some of these things and recognizing the verbal community and what their reinforcers are and what their needs are, we need to have um, some of that there. Um, and so I think that, you know, for us, this was a major consideration for this, this study. Some of the reviewers early on were like, yeah, this is a behavior analytic study. You got very clear visual effects. You don't need that effect size. Um, and so we kind of worked with the AE, uh, Dr. Rafe on that. And was like, well, listen, um, I respectfully disagree with that take, but here's why. And we created a stronger argument for that and um, ended up refining the analyses even more to make it a little bit more compatible with what behavior analysts, I think, would find palatable, uh, which made it a stronger paper. Um, so I appreciated that feedback from the reviewers and kind of forced us to make that argument stronger, um, which I think was very helpful. So and that's my little rant on that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the rant. And just for those who who did not have you know the opportunity to take a quantitative methods class, and the only thing they know is single case design. In, in one cent, one or two sentences, what is an effect size? Just so we can get everyone on the same page here. An effect size is kind of a standardized way to determine the changes between kind of your baseline or control condition and your experimental phases or group or condition. And so it the, the importance with effect size is that there is a common way to do it so that you could aggregate effect sizes across studies and compare apples to apples. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of different ways you could arrive at it with different kinds of data. At the end of the day, it's like, take your mean of the intervention minus your mean of the control condition and divide it by, you know, your, your starting point in the control condition and kind of gets you an effect size. Like that's a very simplistic way to approach it, but that's kind of what it is. It's just how strong was the finding yes, um, okay. in one number. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, that's, that was my impression of what that was. So thank you for confirming that. So I just want to, again, make sure everyone else uh, is on the same page as, as well, because it's been a long time since, uh, sure. uh, since my stats classes and, uh, it's not, it's not a, it's not something I, I, I come across all that frequently. So, um, so you're starting to have attention from outside of the field, which is cool. Uh, I know this is the Inside Java series, um, but w w was there any consideration? I don't, I don't think you're going to hurt John's feelings uh, here, but uh, 
was there any consideration of like, you know, maybe this could go in some sort of, you know, wonkish policy type of journal or, or anything like that? Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know. Talk to talk to me about the 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 out the choice of outlet here. Yeah, uh, Brett, do you want to comment on this? Because I know we talked about this quite a bit. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we were we were really pretty adamant on on getting this into Java from from the get go, um, and, and I think in large part because we wanted this to echo the work that's been done, the excellence of policy analysis that's been done, um, published largely in Java, but by behavior analysts as a whole. Um, we drew so heavily upon that work, and we 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 tried so. Um, adamantly to to do that justice um but also it, it's been um lighter in publication trend as of late and so kind of wanted to get that in some capacity maybe kickstarted back again but also um i think that this was always designed and and hoped to be a, a java paper yeah i would agree with that um Part of it is our respect for what you know work was done in the 70s and 80s with policy in Java and just seeing some trends about what people consider behavior analytic or you know how do you approach an AB design and seeing like you know shifts away from kind of respecting some of the complications of that work. Uh, but us being able to, you know, we were able to add in um, some new suggestions like these linear regression models that you can use to look at comparison designs in a way that would have, you know, statistical methods designed by behavior analysts um, so that you can still evaluate those and try to shed new light on that. And, you know, you could go back and reanalyze those existing data to show that they were effective using these, uh, these use of new sophisticated models and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, we always viewed this as a Java paper. We viewed it as, you know, like this is, you know, KU with its, history and social validity and community research it'd be great if we could contribute to that history as well especially with data from ku uh so that was never a question um hopefully you know this will get some attention by people outside of java and that's kind of our goal with this dissemination so as i said before like we we received an email from someone doing a meta-analysis and they wanted a copy of of the paper we also got an email from someone who's part of a nonprofit uh, who advocates for non-smoker rights. Um, they found the paper and you know wanted a copy so that they could share it with their group. So it's already getting um, some attention from non-behaviorists, which I think is great. And it's not even in print yet; it's just online. So hopefully, okay. we'll see more of that. So if I'm, I don't want to read too much between the lines here, but you don't think that that's uh, that's going to hurt your discoverability at all? Uh, not being in a, a policy-oriented outlet. I don't think, you know, with today's world, um, yeah, with, you know, ResearchGate and Google Scholar, like outlet, I don't think matters as much as it used to, um, as long as you've got something in there where people can find some similarity. So I think having the effect sizes and the p-values and the statistics is what makes this accessible to other people who might not have, you know, read a Java paper before. Um, so I think just kind of peppering that in, not not to like substitute for visual inspection, but to complement it and add a little additional description of your findings. I don't think it does any harm. Um, that's my hot take is I think all behavior analysts should be including that with their work. Um, it doesn't change your visual inspection. Like if you don't have, if you don't have an effect in your visual display, don't use stats. Like that's, that would be my other hot take. Like that, what's the point of doing that? And that's a Don Bear thing. Like, there's no effect. If you can't see it in your graph, stats is just going to, it's going to mask it. Um, but if you've got that effect, then yeah, supplement it with that effect size and that P value so that other people can respect what that effect was if they don't know how to apply baseline logic to a reversal design, for example. I'd like to add to, to what Derek and Brett have, have said here. I, one of the, the things that I hear authors say a lot is, is questioning what belongs in Java. And I think that uh, the experiences that, that Derek and Brett have had and the history behind KU and the works that have already appeared in Java, um, these researchers are in a, in a very good position to understand that this does, in fact, in, in belong in a journal like Java. But I also want to say that I think that Derek has served as a model for 
um, being able to speak to his behavior analysis colleagues, but also to other colleagues. So let me be clear, I would love to see more of this work in Java, but Derek's MO is that he's going to put some work in Java, and then he's going to put some work in some other journals too. And what that does is it cross-pollinates because the folks in those other policy-related journals, for example, or or in other disciplines are going to refer back to the Java stuff. And then that's going to be a bi-directional flow of communication. And, and again, that I think that is a, an essential feature of effective dissemination that one, we're uh, talking in a similar language, but also talking to different audiences and, and recognizing that there's multiple audiences to which we need to communicate, I think is a, a really effective step in good communication and good science. That's a really good point. It reminds me of the work of uh, one of my um, one of my favorite uh, professors at Auburn, uh, Dr. Chris Newland, who's done a lot of work in the toxicology field, uh, but uh, and published both in those journals as well as JAB, and, and et cetera. So, um, yeah, good, good, good point, John. I appreciate that. Um, I, I guess I have one last question, uh, and, and do you have your? Uh, su- this sounds like, like such a such a monumental process, a Herculean task, I suppose, given the number of years in the making. Um, uh, are you going to do this again in some other context, or looking at some other target? Uh, is it does this represent a, a a change in research focus for you uh, in particular, Derek or Breda? You know, um, in, in terms of more policy oriented research because it seems to me like the behavioral examination of these things is wide open um and and i'm you know so I, i'm just curious to has this lit a fire for you guys to to maybe go out more in this direction despite the challenges and the complications and the the you know the the you know again the the dismal nature of of, of the of the scientific endeavor of these types of messy messy circumstances so can um, I, I guess that would be my last question. And I'd also like to just uh, give you guys the opportunity, if there's anything that you want to say about the paper that we, John and I didn't think to ask, uh, I want to give you the, the, uh, the floor as well. Sure. So to the first point about research lines, um, yes, absolutely. This has been a really cool opportunity for me. Um, I'm someone who trained in in school psychology and had courses in consultation, and you got to learn how to talk to other people and get buy-in. And that's always just been something I've enjoyed like the challenge of. Um, but this was kind of our first major research uh, foray using those sort of skills. Um, since then, uh, we've really, I'd, I'd say 90% of the research we do in our applied behavioral economics laboratory is now collaborative with non-behaviorists. Um, we're part of a, a really large NSF grant, it's $24 million, and it's to look at ways to um, empirically inform infrastructure policy in the state of Kansas. And so we're working with three different universities, uh, engineers, computer scientists, public administration, in this extremely large five-year project um, that is super fun. And so a lot of work with economists. Um, and so we're working hard on that. Um you know, uh, with Brett on the line here, uh, one of the areas that we've done some work as well is in our tornado research. And we went to a conference, a tornado conference, which was Mm. extremely interesting um, years ago. And what was really telling to us is that every talk, and it was all engineers, except for me and Brett. um, And every talk ended with like, this is all great from an engineering perspective, but None of this matters if people don't change their behavior and use what we're doing. And if only we had a way. And that was super motivating for us because, you know, we're sitting in the back like, yeah, we could do that. We know how to do that. Um, We had a similar thing happen at Society for Behavioral Medicine, where every talk would end with this research is great. But if we can't control human behavior, understand it, then none of this work matters. And so that's become like a a crusade of, of mine and our lab is to find ways to get ourselves at the table with with those researchers to supplement that because collectively we could do a lot of good um and so like that's my biggest reinforcer right now in terms of my work is working with non-behaviorists um yeah and you know brett is now working with you know in behavioral pharmacology on his postdoc so i don't know brett like if you want to speak to that at all about how that's been but sure i, I you know I- 
I, I think kind of echoing the same thoughts there. This was a project that really got that passion fired up and um, operating at the intersection of behavior analysis and, and, and policy analysis is something that I would I would love to continue doing in my f- future. Now, of course, right now, my research is is somewhat guided by necessity and and I'm, you know, very much focused on um, building up chops and particular skill sets right now as a postdoc. But down the road, uh, this is absolutely a, a type of um, research endeavor that I would like to continue as much as possible, where possible. And um, as, as I sort of briefly mentioned, some of my background is actually in environmental studies and sustainability. And, and I think there is an enormous potential here to extend this style of work specifically within that sphere. So, you know, hopefully more to come um, in this domain. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I just want to congratulate you guys on, uh, you know, just uh, submitting a really novel and, and, and fun, I should say, cause I think it's a, it's a, it is a fun paper to read. Uh, uh, and, and it makes some unique contributions to the existing, uh, job of literature. So, uh, thanks for endeavoring that, uh, on, on that. And thanks to all the co-authors too. There's, uh, you know, again, there's a number of people on this paper as well. Um, yeah, so I, I appreciate that. And uh, John, thanks for uh, this is your first uh, uh, inside Java on your own. So <laughs> thanks sure for that, those thoughtful comments at, at the beginning as well to get us started. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this one. This was good. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast.